The biology of the breast. Look past the superficial and look inside. This is the owner's eye view of inside the breast. Let me show you around. This mammogram view only distinguishes non-opaque fatty tissues from the denser opaque glandular parenchyma and stroma matrix. While this 3D MRI simulation more clearly shows the mammary parenchyma suspended by the matrix. The breasts are unique in that only rudimentary development occurs during the fetal stage, but it is now believed that this is when some of the first events towards the predisposition to developing breast cancer may occur. The female breast remains in the undeveloped state until after the first decade of life, when a girl's estrogen and progesterone levels start to rise and puberty starts. Rapid hormone responsive growth of the breast occurs during puberty, which also seems to be a major window for events that eventually increase susceptibility to cancer. A late puberty significantly reduces the subsequent development of cancer, as does early menopause, both reducing the length of time the tissues are exposed to growth-stimulating cycles of estrogen and progesterone. Breast density on mammogram is parallels the lifetime increase and decrease of breast tissue, and a tendency to increase breast density has been linked to breast cancer. Now let us have a look at a graphical representation of the number of these menstrual cycles of hormones, estrogen and progesterone, per lifetime. I call this a picket fence graft with the taller posts marking the years and 13 posts or cycles per year. This example of a never pregnant menopausal woman starts at age 12 to 13 with the first few irregular cycles. Then from ages 13 to 50 we have 13 regular cycles a year and after 50 several more irregular cycles which would make for a total of around 500 estrogen progesterone driven cycles in a lifetime. Now compare this with the woman's grandmother who had had only a hundred lifetime cycles starting with a later onset of menstruation then 10 term pregnancies with periods of lactation from a few months to over two years this much lower number of total estrogen progesterone cycles, especially at a younger age, can significantly lessen the chances of subsequent tumor outgrowth. The breast parenchyma consists of a dozen or so individual lobes which join at the nipple, looking very much like a tightly planted clump of trees. From the nipple, the ducts of each lobe branches out into the space between the nipple and the chest wall each lobe apparently having its own catchment area of varying sizes. In this ductogram example of one very large lobe, we magnify an almond-sized section of the breast tissue. Removing the supporting matrix reveals a dense network of branching ducts and lobular tissues, along with blood and lymphatic vessels and fat. This is the functional part of the mammary gland, where the milk is made. Magnifying this apple seed sized field, we see that the branched ducts are covered with terminal ducts, organized into blossom-like clusters of what are called TDLUs, terminal ductal lobular units. TDLUs can be described as a functional unit of the gland and are also believed to be the site of origin of most breast tumors. A tendency towards having more and larger TDLUs has been linked to breast cancer and possibly increased breast density on mammograms. An individual TDLU consists of an extralobular and an intralobular terminal duct and the lobular glandular tissue made up of branching asini. These TDLUs typically measure about 0.5 millimeters or 500 micrometers in diameter, approximately the size of a pinprick. Here is a simulation of new TDLUs side branching from a major duct. 
This delicate branch may have originated from a single mammary stem cell in the duct. Growth likely occurs in spurts, a result of menstrual cycle hormonal induced proliferations. TDLUs clustered along the main ducts have been likened to blossoms on a tree. Ones that take years to grow to full maturity may last for decades and are ever on the verge of ripening, ready to bear milk. The bud-like TDLUs cycle to the verge of blossoming, then back again in response to hormonal changes during the four-week menstrual cycle. They are the most compact in the two-week follicular phase, during and after the menstrual period, then enlarge after ovulation to peak during the late luteal phase, the week before the next menstrual period. These estrogen and progesterone induced cycles parallel changes in the uterus in preparing for pregnancy. The frequency of the four week cycle may be necessary for the uterus to maintain a high level of fertility, but the reasons for monthly collateral changes in the breast are not well understood. But there is now evidence for progesterone being indirectly involved in mammary stem cell expansion during the luteal phase. Viewed in 3D, the TDLUs temporarily increase in size and the SNI inflate, elongate, and possibly branch, then reverse this process. These cycles would be growth neutral in the normal adult resting breast, cumulative in the still maturing adolescent breast, and contribute to the decrease in parenchyma tissue in the perimenopausal and menopausal stages. Age-related regulation of this process would impact on age-related breast density. Except for interruptions during pregnancy and lactation, these cycling changes would be ongoing throughout a woman's fertile years. A never pregnant menopausal woman would have had as many as 500 hormonal induced cycles. These ongoing cycles of cell proliferation and especially mammary stem cell proliferation open up frequent windows of higher susceptibility to accumulating mutations. Maturation of the TDLUs during pregnancy also involves an expansion of mammary stem cells, an increasing number of branched acini, as well as increased length and volume of the acini. Then in late pregnancy, functional maturation occurs with the development of inflated secretory alveoli within the acini and then the production of colostrum, the first and very important nourishment for the baby. The acini are made up of a continuous inner layer of epithelial cells, shown here as crystal clear cells, and an outer web-like covering of myoepithelial cells, shown here in blue. The lactating acini expand balloon-like with milk and are emptied by the squeezing of the myoepithelial cells, triggering the letdown of milk in response to the baby's suckling. Clostrum and milk comprise an awesome array of essential nutrients for the offspring. These functional maturation related changes entail a profound remodeling of the breast tissue that only occurs during pregnancy and remains intact until the cessation of lactation when involution, a rapid remodeling reduces the breast towards a non-lactating menstrual cycling state. Women. Most of us are blissfully unaware of what occurs inside our breasts when for 40 years our hormones take us on a monthly roller coaster ride to the verge of pregnancy. After years of research, we are now starting to understand how estrogen and progesterone control the fluctuations and functions of our breasts and what occasionally goes awry. This is the price we pay for our bodies being able to produce and nutritionally nurture our species. We need to appreciate this basic truth and look inside and look after ourselves.